is up browns fans welcome into your victory monday edition of the daily dog takes i'm your host jacob at roachism 13 and i am back from my brief three-day hiatus in which i stayed off twitter and social media and just kind of relaxed and enjoyed stuff and then watched some football today i'm of course recording this on sunday today is monday september 26th as you are watching this i am rocking the victory monday homage shirt as you can see with brownie the elf very soft, very comfortable. You got to get it for next week, for the future weeks in which you're dealing with the Victory Monday. If you are checking this out on Twitter, if you go to the comment section under here, I will put a link to this shirt. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and check out the it'll, the link to the shirt will be in the description, as well as if you're listening to the audio version, you want to get a, your hands on one of these awesome, awesome shirts from the awesome people over in Homage, proud sponsor of Network 216, then you can go check those things out. I've got them all, the links up in the bios, and very soft, very comfortable, very good way to enjoy a victory Monday um, as your Browns beat the Cle- <laughs> your Cleveland Browns, beat the Pittsburgh Steelers 29 to 17, and it is always a good day to beat the Steelers. So today we're going to do a kind of a recap. I have uh, rewatched the film, watched it a couple of times this weekend, kind of took my time with it. Um, Members of the Barking Browns Patreon, if you go to patreon.com slash Barking Browns show, you can watch that rewatch with me as I record those and upload them to Twitter, or I'm sorry, to YouTube, the private YouTube channel in which uh, we do the condensed version. So it's like a 40 minute video of me just kind of giving some commentary and breaking it down. Today we're going to talk about the offense. Tomorrow we will talk about the defense and break all of that stuff down. What I saw, what I like, what I don't like, but they got to clean up if they want to go to three and one next week against the Falcons. Now, listen, one thing that I want to say here out of the gate, and I think everybody has said it on Twitter. Everybody will probably continue to say it on Twitter. And that is simple. There is one 3-0 team in the AFC. Right now, as Sunday Night Football is playing, the Browns are third in the AFC. Or they were third earlier. I don't remember what time of day I saw that. So as we sit here with Sunday Night Football playing and all of that stuff and Monday Night Football still to play out and all of those things, there's only one team that has an overall better record than the Browns. And the Browns should be one, the second 3-0 team right now. They really should. Um, you know, if, if, if it's and butts were candy and nuts, I'd be a very happy man. Yeah, I get that. So I understand that and all that stuff. But what I'm getting at is, yeah, the Jets game, that was horrible. That was a really hard thing to swallow. But as we sit here, as we are right now, Monday, September 26th, the Cleveland Browns are still all in it. The Patriots, we don't know. It looks like a high ankle sprain for Mac Jones. We don't know what that, that game suddenly is a little bit different. Uh, they don't look as good. Uh, the Bengals, it is what it is. You know, the Bills are beatable. Like all the it's a mess in, in, in Tampa. So all of this stuff is all I'm getting at is this is an incredibly talented uh, team in Cleveland. And if they can fix some of their deficiencies on defense, we can get a really interesting uh, ride for the rest of it. So let's talk about the offense, man. Let's let's go. Let's start first um, with PFF grades here. Jacoby Brissett with a 92.5 overall grade, a 90.4 passer rate uh passing grade from PFF. We'll talk about that here in a second. David Njoku with an 89.6 and 90.8 in the pass game and 72.2 in the pass block. Only a 56 in run block. He had some, uh, a, a few misses here and there. Uh, 80 for Wyatt Teller. Nick Chubb is 76. Ethan Poach is 75. Joel Petonio is 75. Um, six snaps for James Hudson, a 72. Amari Cooper, I thought was much better than the 66 they gave him. Jack Conklin in his return, a 69. Jed Wills, a 63. And that's the top. Michael Don finishes with 32 in uh, 14 snaps there at the bottom down there. So there's your offensive grades as we as we kind of <coughs> make our way through this and we talk about this. I just want to start off by talking to all the people that told me all offseason that Kevin Stefanski needed to give up play calling and say, how do you feel about that now? And if you are vindictive and just say, I think he's an awful coach and he doesn't know how to call plays, I just don't think you and I are watching the same sport. I don't think you and I are watching the same games, if that's what you think. The the creativity and the just the overall plan of attack in the scheme that Kevin Stefanski has presented in three games has been good enough to make the team 3-0 and in offense. Yes, he needs to take some responsibility from some of the issues that's going on in defense. I think he is trying to remedy them. Um, there was no massive blown coverages up, up, to the caliber in which they allowed the first two weeks this week. So that was at least progress. And now you got 10 days that hopefully focusing on the Falcons, you can figure some of the things out better, but we'll talk about the defense tomorrow. This offensive line is just, 
it's so fun to watch and, and i hope you guys agree with me and you can comment and send me messages and comment on the video and that sort of thing just the way Bill Callahan and Stefanski and, and I know Alex Van Pelt's got a hand in it and stuff, but the way they draw these things up, it's just fun. I mean, they're in so many different types of, uh, of run, and I'm talking about the run, right? Right here, I'm talking about the run, the run game blocking and the way they're, they pull their guys. There is nothing I love more and then to see Big 75 or Big 77, I actually like seeing Joel pull a little bit better because I think he's a little bit, you know, bigger. I think he looks scarier when he runs. I love watching them in front of 27 or 24 because I know if they're pulling out there, as long as it's not like an overload and there's just too many hats for the Browns to block, when they're pulling out there, I know that they're going to lay a big block and that Chubb or Hunt are going to get five, six, seven, eight more, more guards when they pull it out. And they really... I want to give some credit to some props to Ethan Pochich. I thought, and I know I'm probably saying his name wrong, but I really thought he played really well. Uh, he moved really well in the open field. That's what I was excited about Nick Harris was the athleticism and the way to get out and move kind of the way they like to do. I don't think they did it as much last year with Treader because of the, uh, you know, the accumulation of all the injuries that's going on with him there towards the end of his career. So I don't think they did it as much as maybe they wanted to. But Poachers did a really good job getting out and uh, pulling in some situations. There was a really fun scheme where they kind of pulled out um, both Jed and Batonio, and they ran it to the left side, but they pulled them out and just kind of blocked down with everybody else, and they got out. And I think it was like an eight- or nine-yard gain or whatever it was, but it was just it was just so fun to watch the different way they attacked. Like, I don't understand the complexity of, the, of, the, of exactly what a pin pull means or anything like that. When it comes to the way that the offensive line is operating, I'm not, I'm not super well versed in the terminology when it comes to offensive linemen, uh, terminology play wise. But watching them in this run game, just watching, you you can pull anybody. They might pull Jed to the right side. They might pull Jack to the left side. They might pull Batonio to the right side or the left side, or and they might pull the center and the left tackle. It's like you have no idea what they're going to do, but they're going to do it, and the players are going to execute it most of the time pretty well in this run attack. Like Stefanski said it in the mic'd up situation with the, against the Jets where he's like, it's beautiful when you know you're going to run a football, they know you're going to run the football, and they can't stop you. And that is exactly what happened. The Browns finally, listen, Mike Tomlin always figures out what they're doing always figures out how to shut them down. Now, don't get me wrong. The playoff win, uh, they did do some really nice things run-wise. But last year, especially last year, when Baker Mayfield was not a huge threat to throw the ball, Tomlin understood the assignment and he took it away. And, you know, I think that they maybe don't have as many great players this year. I think maybe the – especially with T.J. Watt not being there – but the le overall level of talent isn't that much off to where you could say, well, it's just because the Steelers got well. No, I think Kevin Stefanski and Bill Callahan and Alex Van Pelt, they sat down, they finally figured out a way to exploit this uh, the, the Tomlin scheme, and they did it all night long in the run game. And we haven't even gotten to the pass pro, which I thought was really good. There was one coverage sack early, uh, and then the, the late one where Jed just gets flat out beat on the inside, and, and that's a conversation to have as well, but uh, against Highsmith there at the end of the game. Or I'm not sorry, in the, not the end of the game, but in the second half. Um, it's just, it's so, I just, I hope that fans can really appreciate what they're seeing when it comes to the offensive line. Not just the way it's playing, but the way it's drawn up. I, I think one of the the most interesting plays, and a perfect example of what I mean by just the, the complexity of what they're doing, but they're making it look so effortless with their play and their scheme. And, and it's just the overall play design. It's just so much fun to watch is that fourth down play to Kareem Hunt where he lines up as the fullback. And they really sell a pitch to Nick Chubb on the outside. And Jacoby sold it, sold it so well. I think he must've got off of balance a little bit because after he hands it to Kareem Hunt, he falls down, but they, they have Hunt go this way. Everybody else plays it like it's going to be a pitch to the right, and he kind of turns back around and hands it to him as he looks like he's trying to throw it out to Chubb, and he's going back the other way. And it's just like it was simple yet so well designed that, like, that's not – you just – if you're going to do it, you're going to just hand it to him, right? Just turn around, fullback dive. That's not what they did. They did a fullback dive with a bunch of motion that made you think, oh, did they did they just hand it to Cream Hunt? Seven yards on fourth and one, and and there you are. And I think that was just a perfect example when you watch this on tape and really watch them for the first two games on tape as well. You're looking at a situation where these guys are just being so creative and they understand 
that, you know, Jacoby is limited. Although I will point out, we're going to talk about Jacoby here in a second as we shift over to the passing game, but they understand that they don't have a superstar quarterback. So they're going to have to do a lot of things in the run game. And, the, and what I mean by that is they're going to have to be incredibly creative because they other teams understand their limitations of, as an offense. And last year was the same thing. And they were able to do it last year. They're able to do it this year. But the quarterback is now playing at a better level than the quarterback played last year. And that's the difference between the two. It just it just blows my mind after watching this game specifically, the takes about Kevin Stefanski. I just I get I'm so upset I gotta take a drink of water here. Ridiculous. That's what I think. This was a game where Stefanski and, and Van, Van Pelt and, and Callahan show you that this team together, that trio together, when it comes to the running attack, it's just it's just pretty football. It, it's not, it's pretty football, but it's also like gutsy Cleveland football, right? It's blue collar. It's what we like. It's the like old school guys. You know, they love this, this brand of football and it's just working. And I think it's just, it's just fun to watch. Um, and when you take a step back and just kind of appreciate it and you watch this game and you know how this game turns out and you know that they just, Again, the Stefanski quote just plays over and over in my head. They know you're going to run it. You're, you know you're going to run it, and they can't do anything about it. That's about as simple as it is when it comes to this scheme. Nick Chubb is a special player. Kareem Hunt is better than any number two running back that I've seen in Cleveland ever, and probably one of the best number two running backs in modern football because he should be a starter on some team, and he will be next year. And I will miss Kareem because... I love after their gas chasing Chubb with his cutbacks and, and he's got plenty of power in his game too, but after they're chasing Chubb all over and then you just open up a gate and then just full force, here comes, here comes old uh, Kareem Hunt, just a wrecking ball into the hole. And it's just absolutely fun to watch, but you know, he's just, I'm going to miss him, but uh, right now I'm going to continue to enjoy that tandem while I can. I want to move over to the offensive line. And I want to say that we start talking, move over to the offensive line. I want to move to the passing attack of the Browns. And I want to point out too that right now, one of the biggest things we said about the Browns and in, in their recipe offensively, not their, not their total uh, recipe, but their overall recipe offensively on how they win without Deshaun Watson and not turning the football over was a very imperative thing that we said, you've absolutely you can't like, obviously you're going to turn the ball over. You're not, you're not going to go 11 games without a turnover and they have it. And, and so, but a turnover is one thing, but two, three turnovers and losing the turnover battle. That's when it starts to wear against a team, especially a defense that right now is trying to figure themselves out. So it's up to the offense to not put any more pressure on the defense that isn't already on them. They have one turnover. That is mind-blowing to me. And obviously, I, I realize this watching it, but I mean, I guess I didn't really think of it in the grand scope of, th scope of things, th realizing like, oh my goodness, they've they played three games and they've done all, you know. <clears throat> and obviously, there was some potential turnovers uh, that could have been had on special teams, but in the end, they don't turn that over. And in the end, it wouldn't have been an offensive turnover either. So you're looking at this game and you're thinking, they have they turn the, they don't turn the ball over here against the Steelers in a game where the Steelers don't really turn you know they're not turning the ball over like the defense isn't forcing turnovers either, um, which is even more imperative that they don't turn it over as an offense if the defense isn't getting any takeaways either. So like it's a very important situation there, but I, I think it's just interesting that you go three games with one turnover and it was on a prevent situation where the game you were probably not going to win that game, but you were desperately trying to chuck it downfield, get a big chunk of yards, call a timeout, kick a field goal. So I'm not even all that upset about that 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 interception because I'm more upset about the situation that the uh, defense and special teams put the offense in that, that made that drive even need to happen in the first place. So when it, you know, I, I just I think Jacoby Brissett has been absolutely everything we could have hoped for that first game. I think timing was off. There was just some miscommunications. The out route, I just I felt he was off, and, and he couldn't hit any outbreaking routes, which he is hitting just fine now these last two games he has been excellent somebody pointed out that his statistics right now if they extend over this year are very 
very similar to 2020 Baker Mayfield numbers. That's interesting. That's really, really interesting because, and I've heard other analysts, I believe Jake Burns was the one that I heard most recently say it, that people you know, were like, why didn't they pay Baker Mayfield? Well, they just paid Jacoby Brissett a lot less money to produce the same type of results. And, and Jake has said that many a times, and I'm right there with him, that that shows you the, the level of confidence in the roster and the scheme in which the quarterback is playing in that you can get good enough quarterback play. Now, you're only throwing for 220 yards, and in this game, two touchdowns, no interceptions. But, like, Baker didn't have many blow-away games. I mean, he has the five-touchdown game, but he only throws for 297 in that. It wasn't like a 400-yard, a 500-yard game. A lot of his games were the upper 200s in, or lower 300s, which is still more yardage than Brissett is currently throwing for. But in all three games, Brissett has done enough. Obviously, the Panthers game wasn't great, but he still has done enough in these games uh, passing the football. And a lot of that has to do with the offensive line. I will go, I've gone back, I've watched a lot of Jacoby Brissett in Indianapolis, in Miami, especially Miami last year. He has not ever had an offensive line like this in front of him. I think he was not totally confident in those guys week one. I think that was part of some of the issues that he had. But these last couple of games, like, he is standing tall in the pocket. He looks confident. Um, he just looks like he's in control, that he's leading it. He's confident in his ability to make the read and make the right throw. And he's not bailing a ton of clean pockets. I think he he does create some pressures for himself uh, at times. And I think that was a big problem for them in the Panthers that sometimes he does bail a little bit. Like that was, it's one knock on Baker um, that it's always been a knock on Baker is that from time to time, if he doesn't be able to get the ball out of his hands really quickly on his first read, he may sometimes bail clean pockets. Well, I've seen that some of that in Jacoby Brissett, and that's some of the issues that I kind of have with him here and there. But right now, I mean, you're looking at 26, 30, and 23 offensively. And if you would have told me that a few months ago, that, that were, those were the numbers that Brissett put up. Uh, that the offense put up with Brissett at quarterback, I would have said, yeah, I can absolutely, I'll take that. You're two and one. Okay, absolutely, I'll take that. The biggest thing is, I thought they would start three and one. I did not think they would get the four and zero. Oh. I really, really hoped, but I didn't think they would get four and zero. Oh. I thought they would lose to the Steelers. The fact that their one loss, I wish it was. I do kind of, and part of me wish it was either the Falcons or the Panthers because it would have been an NFC loss. So it really would have helped them come playoff seeding down the line. But having that first win against the Steelers. And I don't think the Steelers are going anywhere, but as long as Mike Tomlin is there and they're not a mathematically eliminated, I'm not going to believe it until I see it because that's just what it's been like for me watching the Pittsburgh Steelers in my lifetime, especially with Mike Tam Tomlin at, co at uh, head coach. But this is just a really good position. And Amari Cooper is on this little, hey, y'all told me I wasn't a number one wide receiver in the NFL anymore. Yeah, I've seen so many people talk about how Amari is a number two. He, we have a number two playing number one, and that's just not the case. If you go out and watch Amari Cooper, these all three games, the statistics weren't there. Bursette missed him quite a bit, but he put J.C. Horn in hell week one. And then he comes out 101 yards and a touchdown, 101 yards again and a touchdown. First Browns player to have 100 yards, over 100 yards receiving and a touchdown since Josh Gordon many, many moons ago. And I just, I look at all of this and I just say, Amari looks like a dude on a mission. And it's good because they're not getting a ton outside of that. David Njoku really shows up. This was a game where the top two guys that we talked about all offseason in the passing attack that needed to carry this team when it came to that situation, this was a game that showed you that. Amari continues to just win with filthy route running. I mean... I am, he's just such a smooth route runner, just the way he can just, I, I look at that, that shot play he took when he looks like he's going to take running that just go route. And he kind of gives like a slight little move at the hips. Like he's going to go outside and then he curves in just a, a deep in route. And, and there's nobody around him until after he catches the football and Brissett puts it on him pretty good. And that's, I think textbook how Amari Cooper wins in the NFL. And it's just, that's about best route runner I've seen in Cleveland. I mean, I love Jarvis Landry. I think Amari Cooper's better. He's more dynamic. And they do not play. They're not the same style of player. But I would have said before this that Jarvis Landry was the best wide receiver route running wise that I had seen in Cleveland since I've been alive, you know, since I've been watching since the return. 
because I, I don't remember anything pre-1999. I barely remember anything early 2000s. So. But this game, too, the David Njoku touchdown, let's talk about that for a second. That is really, really the, the role I, I envisioned for David when he signed this big extension. I love Njoku. People know that. They'll follow me, watch this show, or watch the Barking Browns, or read me on Dog Pound Daily. Understand that that... I like David Njoku. I think he's a really, really good football player. And that touchdown where Brissett just puts it up for him to go up and show, that is what he's got to be. That's the elite athlete, the physical freak that we talk about when we reference him, and that's why you pay him, is more for what you think he can do, not as much what he has done. And that is the type of play that you think he can consistently make with Brissett and eventually Watson, who loves the big body tight ends when you talk about in the red zone and scoring opportunities. And Njoku just... He did a really good job uh, against the zone coverage where he would just sit. There was a lot of like five little curl routes. He'd just sit down in the coverage. Brissett hits him. Uh, he turns it upfield uh, for a couple of yards or goes down. But, you know, it's five, six, seven plus yards, uh, you know, a hit. He goes for 89 and a touchdown. And he just, he was blocking well. The run blocking wasn't quite as good as what it had been the last couple of games. But he was still just, he was doing his job. And he just absolutely was the player that you signed to that massive deal is what you saw on Thursday. It's just a guy that you can rely on when you need to make a play. And there was not a, a ton of just like absolutely wow plays. It was just consistent play, getting open, catching the ball, making something happen. And that touchdown, that was a wow play. That was about as wow as they come, but that is peak what I think he can be. And I think that's what Kevin Stefanski and Andrew Barry envisioned when they signed him to this contract. And so those top two guys, they're balling. Then there's the rest of the crew. Coming up soon, and I think the Chargers are going to be one of the teams that you really got to do this with. But coming up soon, you're going to be in a situation where people are going to double and put rolling coverage over Amari and David Njoku because they're the only guys that have consistently produced. And Amari much more so than, than uh, Njoku because really the, the one game it, this last game was really Najoku's best because he didn't really get anything week one, and he played he played better against the Jets. But you know, you're you're looking at this situation where Amari, is, you're going to need Donovan Peoples Jones. But I, I will say that some people are kind of knocking on the wide receivers outside of Amari. There's not Brissett's not targeting them, and and that there's something to say about are they getting open? Well, I can promise you they're not getting open as well as Amari, and that's why Amari's getting these targets. Um, so I don't know. You know, there's some plays where guys are getting open. There are sometimes they struggle to get open, but right now they're not targeting him. But the point is, these guys got to continue to be ready because when Amari, when they try to shut Amari down, and I don't know if they can do it. I mean, Amari's playing out of his mind, but you're going to play some good defense was, you know, coming up, the Chargers, and you know, you know when you play Bill Belichick, rather they are the Patriots of old or not, you know Belichick is going to understand we got to make him throw the football and not to number two. You know that is going to be a point of it, of emphasis for that team. When they, and, and other teams coming up, even Atlanta will do it. I don't know if they have the personnel necessarily to do anything about it, but you know that is where they're going to focus. Because teams are clearly showing you a plan the last couple of weeks of how they're going to attack Miles Garrett. And, and without Jadavion Clowney, there was nobody to pick up the slack when they were chipping and doubling and doing all the things that they were doing, although I still think Miles had a pretty good game all things considered, uh, and when you watch the tape. But offensively, this is as good of this is as good as we could have hoped for. I think this is a legit team. Yeah, you look around the NFL, um, there are plenty of teams that aren't quite as good as we thought they were. And maybe the Browns aren't as good as we thought they were. They're definitely not as good as we thought they were on defense, at least not through three games anyway. But this is wide open and this offense, I I know, I think the Jets' off defense is better than some people give them credit for, and I understand that they just couldn't produce today. A lot of that had to do with they were on the field the whole day because Joe Flacco just reverted back into Joe Flacco one week too freaking late. But anyway, we just make him look like a superstar, right? Whatever. But I just, I think this Browns offense can score on anybody. Maybe not 30 on anybody, but they can score. They can score 24 points, 24, 25 points. And if the defense can kind of play up to their level soon, I think we can continue to win football games. So all in all, I'm giving this, this performance from the Browns offense a B plus. If you are watching right now on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button, like this video, 
Uh, when you hit that subscribe, you can turn on the bells. we got all kinds of live content coming for you guys on Network 216 here on Twi- YouTube, also on Twitter, in the podcast formats. But if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit subscribe. Please like this video. It helps us out so very much. If you are listening to this audio on Apple Podcasts, consider giving me a, a you know five-star rating and maybe a written review. Or be honest with me. Give me a three-star rating if you think it's a three, and, and, I, and I will continue to work better on that. But I really it really helps us out with the likes and the subscribes and the follows and the shares. And we appreciate all of you showing up each and every day. And I will be back tomorrow to talk about the Browns defense and what I saw against the Steelers before we start to shift gears for the Atlanta Falcons this weekend. Uh, Guys, so I appreciate you guys being here. And as always, go Browns.